Hey there, welcome to the Flit360 podcast. I'm Dr. Heidi K. Begay, and I'm a flutist, educator, coach, and podcaster. My God given mission is to serve you. I am passionate about guiding you, the modern day flutist, to discover your unique voice on and off the stage. The goal of this podcast is to help you thrive both as an artist and as a musicpreneur. Go ahead and grab some espresso, your favorite notepad, and let's get to it. Today's episode 182 is titled, Let's Talk Music Business with Eric Branner. Hey there, flute 360 er Welcome back to another episode. Before we dive into our discussion with Eric Branner, I want to give you a friendly heads up. And that is this Wednesday, coming up Wednesday, December 15th at 6 p.m. Central Time, I am offering a free webinar. So this webinar is perfect for the modern day podcaster. If you have a digital baby wrapped up into your podcast show and you want to start generating another stream of income through your platform, then you really need to come and hang out with me this Wednesday at 6 p.m. to hear some really great tips how you can start generating sponsorships. You probably already start generating revenue through different streams such as your offerings and services like lessons, group lessons, master classes, being a clinician, an adjudicator. That is all wonderful. Another stream of income that the Flute 360 show relies on is through corporate sponsorships. Now, when I reach out to these different businesses, I am always having the thought of we need to find the win-win for everybody involved. I'm not talking about just getting a check for the month. I am looking for the longevity of that relationship. I am trying to find the win-win for everybody involved because why not? I'm not about to be selfish and start asking for me, me, me. I want to highlight these companies in really unique, meaningful, beautiful ways. And how can I, through my little digital baby, how can I serve them? How can I get eyes and ears onto their company to uplift them, to keep their business going? And then when I start looking, you know, of how I can uplift said person and said company, then the blessings come back also onto Flute 360. So I'm rambling and it's only because I am extremely passionate about this stream of income. It's all about people and not transactions. So if this is something that really resonates with you and you want to start learning a little bit more about corporate sponsorships, the benefits of corporate sponsorships for your podcast, then come hang out with me next Wednesday, December 15th at 6 p.m. Central Time. If you want your Zoom link, please go to HeidiKBegay.com, sign up to the mailing list, and the Zoom link will be sent right into your inbox. See you soon. Hey there, welcome back to another Flute 360 podcast episode. Today's episode is episode 182, and it is with a wonderful guest, a huge pivotal force within our music community. My guest is Eric Branner. He is a guitarist, a teacher. We met through the Ultimate Music Business Summit in 2021. And since then, our relationship has scaled, and I'm so appreciative of him being in my orbit. Not only is he a guitarist and a music teacher out in Seattle, but he is also the CEO of Bonds. And we're going to talk about that here in a little bit. But without further ado, welcome, Eric, to the show. Hi there, Adi. Thank you so much for having me. It's great to be here. Oh, my goodness. I'm just so stoked because I think the last time you and I talked was a couple months ago. And we just got on an hour chat just to say, hey, what's up? <laughs> and I learned a lot from you during that call. And I knew that we would be within each other's orbits even more looking into like future collaborations. Awesome. Well, it's great to be here. Thank you so much. Yeah. So how's your day? How's Seattle? How's your studio? 
Uh, you know, everything is good. It's a beautiful day here in Seattle, which is a real treat at this time of year. And uh, my studio is great. You know, I'm currently teaching about 20 students a week, 15 to 20. I've been trying to pair that back, but I'm kind of an inveterate music teacher. I can't really, I can't leave, I can't give it up. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> now, do you teach all age ranges or is it a particular age group? You know, I really do. You know, my, I have an interesting kind of pedagogy background. You know, I'm a third generation music teacher. You know, my grandfather's a music teacher and I'm just, I'm way into it. And although I'm a classical guitar player, I also, I grew up playing all different kinds of styles. So for me, I'm really more focused on the, on the type of student that I teach and where they are in their, their journey. So I have students ranging from the age of like eight to 55 right now. And the majority of them are high school students and college students. I really love that age. I really appreciate helping people kind of navigate those awkward years and using music as like a tool for, you know, something to learn discipline and focus and having something to really relate to. So hmm. I'd say the majority of my students are in high school. Oh, that's amazing. Yeah. They're so lucky to have you. Uh, the age range that I, I love teaching all students, little hmm. ones all the way to, you know, the older generation, but I really am drawn to the 20 year olds. Oh. So college age, graduate school age. And I think it's an exciting time because they're finding their own. They're starting to step into, you know, the real world of figuring out their degrees and how they want to navigate their careers and to be a mentor within that season. It's mm -hmm. just so exciting for me. Oh yeah. That is, that is a special time for sure. Yeah. Cool. Do you remember the twenties? <laughs> <laughs> or being yeah. in your 20s. <laughs> yes, I do. When you could practice four to seven hours every day. And yeah, it was beautiful. Yeah, yeah right. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> I love the practicing you could do in your 20s. That was the best. Mm, yeah, you could put life on pause mm -hmm. and just zone in. Yep. Yeah. So we talked a little bit about your background, being a teacher, a guitarist, the CEO of Fonz. Is there anything else that you would like to share with the listeners? Well, you know, those are kind of the things that really drive me. And, and, you know, as I've always been a music teacher, I've been really uh, grateful to be able to be, um, to make a living as a music teacher and as a musician. And my, you know, my wife's an actor. We live here in Seattle. Uh, and, you know, the the journey of venturing into Fonz was so interesting because I, being in Seattle, I was able to connect with uh, some really great people in the technology space that looked at how a business such as a music teacher's would run and said, oh, you know, this is, there's probably a way we could streamline this and automate it and make it a much more simple arrangement. And then I became really interested in the business side of it and mm -hmm. realized um, that so many musicians just don't really have a business acumen baked into them, whether it's because of who they studied with and how it used to be done or the, the mentality of the you know, adjunct professor lifestyle that so many of us have lived and, mm -hmm. you know, are trying to go gig to gig. So I got really fascinated and started studying the people that were making great livings. You know, a decade ago, there was a handful of people in the country that were making well into the six figures teaching and they were doing something different. It wasn't like they were a particularly a better teacher or a different teacher. It's like they just had a business sense and they were willing to 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 create an organization around it. So I got fascinated by that and hmm. uh, really started studying not just music teachers, but people in the academic tutoring space, personal traders, anyone that worked in kind of client-based business and started looking for these through lines of what we could do to start elevating it. And that's become kind of my mission. You know, yes, hmm. I, this, I work on this app that runs a business and streamlines it. But the big thing is saying, oh my gosh, musicians should be treated like you know, my best friend's a doctor, you know, we have this, we go to just as much school often, and we contribute just as much to our communities. And I'm really kind of on this, this real search to try to just elevate the whole idea of what it means to be a creative or a musician, and from how we get paid, and to mm -hmm. how we're valued, and how we're, you know, how we go into a party and say, yeah, I'm a music teacher, you know, I, yeah, I change people's lives. That's awesome. I'm a musician. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of become my my reason to be. Yeah, that's amazing. You could not have said that any better. So speaking of owning your value, I know I'm kind of jumping ahead of our plan, but since you brought it up, why do you think musicians don't really fully value themselves in the prices through their product services and offerings? Why do you think we undervalue some of these things sometimes? 
Mm, you know, I, th I think it's a great question. And I think it's historically, maybe musicians are people that aren't, unless you're at a very certain tier, aren't people that are traditionally, you know, paid well. There's the idea of the starving artist uh, that there's, you know, unless you, gosh, you go all the way back to Bach when everybody was looking for patrons and trying to find someone to support them. Some people were lucky mm. enough to have them. Many weren't. I think there's just a mind shift. And I think it's something that's baked into them. I know that Mm. A lot of the greatest teachers I've studied with in my career did not value themselves. And I paid them way less than what I probably could have or should have. Mm. And I think that's just kind of, it's a historical norm that we really, as a community, would be a great idea to shift. And I mm. think the education space has been the spot to do it. And I know that for me, being in Seattle, my value proposition is that I really I'm pretty confident I've taken a lot of kids through this journey of growing up mm. and using guitar and music and that community around it to help become successful as a human being, whether mm. it's how you use your mind or how you express yourself. And people really value that, right? Mm. And so at the core level of, say, my teaching business, that has all allowed me to charge a rate that allows me to make a great living. Mm. And I learned that the more I charged... And the more I asked from my clients, the more they valued me. Yeah. Then the more they would do well with their studies. And then they'd go out and they'd be advertising for me by performing or just being themselves. And it's a self-perpetuating improvement that works for anyone that's serious about what they're doing. And, you know, it's effective and it's honest and it's authentic. So hmm. that's kind of, that's a long answer, but how I feel about it. No, it was a perfect answer. And besides raising our rates, right, the actual just doing the thing, <laughs> what else can we do to start valuing what we have to offer to our community more? Is it like the mindset and like a paradigm shift? Is it, like you said, pulling business people into your orbit and realizing how they do their thing and realizing your value and then making sure that the prices match that? Mm. Well, you know, I... That's an awesome question. And yeah. I think that, and it's one we delve into a lot. And I'll just offer a couple of things that I think we see is, you know, shifting your mindset's really important, right? But until you actually go out there and have one client, like let's say you charge $50 a lesson, I'm just gonna throw some random numbers, right? Okay. And let's say one day you decide to double your rates and mm -hmm. you're gonna charge $100 for your lessons. And you just think you'll never get it. And you never, will. and then you get, once you get one client that does, and you're like, whoa. And then you bring so much more to that because you're getting paid better. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there's a story that I, I love to share that, you know, I had a studio in Seattle. It was doing what I thought was really well. And my wife and I were getting ready to start a family. And I assumed that meant it was time for me to move on to law school or get my MBA, which I'd always thought that'd be part of my plan was to, mm. you know, somewhere in that window, go get a grad degree in business or law and kind of shift gears a little bit and still do music, but have that in my back pocket. And I was fortunate enough to have this mentor and he was a very well-known person in Seattle. He had just turned 60 and he was one of my students and he was like, Branner, don't go get an MBA. You need to be doing what you're doing here, which is teaching and helping kids double your rates, man. And I was like, there's no way I'm doing that. And he's like, do it, double your rates. Yeah. And I really reluctantly did it because it was that or kind of leave the profession. And what happened was, it was a massively awesome moment. This was 15 years ago before my daughter was born hmm. is that, you know, eight weeks later I had a waiting list. So not only did I make twice as much money, eight weeks later, I just couldn't, I was turning people away. And then I had to raise my rates again. And I realized I'd kind of found this, this deal where I'd valued myself enough to say, this is what I need to make it work for me and yeah. to feel really good about it. And then everyone was like, okay, cool, no problem. And then suddenly I'm making a great living. And then I'm bringing that into my studio and doing better work. And then the other thing that, that comes into this, there's so many variables, huh. is this idea of perceived value comes in. Mm. Where now everybody's saying, oh, this person's charging more than everybody else, but I can't get in. That just makes them want to get in. Mm. You know, and lastly, you know, when you, whenever this conversation comes up, it's really important to talk about equity too and being able to have other people access it. Because I know a lot of people say, oh my gosh, you're charging all this money. And then what does that mean for people that otherwise could, that they can't afford this? You know, what is that? What kind of person does that make you? Huh. Well, it also allowed me to, to not charge people at all because I was charging so much for my lessons that if someone came in, a single mom or whatever, and really wanted mm. their kid to study, I could just be like, or I was like, it's cool. 
don't pay me because all these other people are. So it really created a lot of great energy in my studio. It allowed it to grow. It allowed me to raise my family, buy a house here in Seattle. And I was really grateful for that. And, you know, I think it got to a point when I started Fonz where I was just looking to add something else into it, right? Mm. To try to to further streamline it. And so that's, it's a, it's a long answer again, but it's a good journey. Yeah, no, that's amazing. And our mutual friend, Dr. Garrett Hope, actually was my career coach during my pivot when I decided to leave academia and to be my own boss and to the, to be this digital entrepreneur running my audio business and my flute business. And he was going through and just fine tuning my business plan and my model and things like that. And he goes, you're charging what for flute lessons? And I said, well, that's the going rate in this DFW area. He's like, I'm sorry. And you know, Garrett, he is a loving, welcoming man. And he put his foot down. He's like, I am sorry. That is not going to happen. You have your doctorate and you're charging that little. And same thing. I said, okay. I just like tripled it overnight. I left the districts because if you're in the district teaching in the DFW area, you have to abide by their rates. You can't change it. You can't say, well, I have a master's or I have a doctorate. You have to go by their rates. And so I pulled out of the district. I said my rates. I put up on my website. Same thing, students. And the minute I owned that value and put it out there, same thing. Then people are like, oh, well, that makes sense. You have a DMA. <laughs> like, why would you charge any less? You know? And so all of that's to say I resonate with what you're saying. Yeah. And then the people that seek you out are people that take it more seriously. The people, you know, the, and they find you based. It, it, to be fair, it's like, you know, my, my children, of course, since my wife's an actor and I'm a guitar player, mm. my kids are both very much into athletics. We knew that was going to happen. And, <laughs> you know, we're out there looking for the best coaches for them. Right. Mm. And we don't really know how to judge them. And often we do the same thing. We're like, oh, this person obviously knows what they're doing. They're charging a professional rate and they've, they've got to be good. And that factors into our minds, especially when it's a parenting decision, right? We're trying to find something mm -hmm. to help navigate a young person's path is people want someone that's trusted and someone mm -hmm. that knows what they're doing, especially if we don't, right? I don't know mm -hmm. anything about basketball. I'm trusting someone else to do that. And most people don't know much about flute. Mm -hmm. and that's why they're trying to find someone like you that can guide them or their, their loved one on a journey. It's important. Mm, I love it. So you hinted at Fonz and how you wanted to integrate Fonz into everything that you've established, you know, being a studio teacher and all of that. I'm kind of curious just because I have a reasoning behind this question and I can explain later, but in a way, like I'm guessing Fonz was established because you saw a problem and you wanted a solution to a problem, correct? But then also my second question is in a weird way, did Fonz kind of find you? Yes. And yes. Okay. That's a, that's a great question. How did I end up starting a technology company and where did yeah. that come from? You know, there was definitely a point where I was, I'd been doing it for 10 years, this teaching full-time, or I'd actually been teaching full-time for 15 years. And my wife, Allison ran my school, right? And we had this great, we had a great thing going. She ran the school. She really white gloved it. We offered a real boutique service. We we're making a great living and it was really fun great impact on the community, but it was really labor intensive. And she was spending eight or 10 hours a week. Plus we had this huge issue with like sending out invoices every month. And, you know, I, I teach a relatively affluent clientele, right. And mm -hmm. being here in Seattle. And we noticed that the people that almost the more means that they had, the less likely they were to pay us on time. So we were sitting on a ton of money that just wasn't coming in on time every month. And we had great relationships with these people. They, I just don't think at that time they understood how meaningful that invoice was to send in. Mm. And so I basically hooked up with someone who was more or less a household name in Silicon Valley, who was really interested in what we did and was like, hey, let's, let's talk about automating what you're doing. And so, and see if there's some path to making that happen, we can use new technology. And I was like, great, I know everything. I probably have one of the most successful studios in the country. And, you know, he brought together this team of engineers, designers, and we you know, kind of sat down, they followed me around and I showed them how I did my business. And I really just wanted to automate what I had previously done, which is, you know, sending out invoices and all that stuff. And after about a day, they were just like, this is the most inefficient thing we've ever seen. And it's like, <laughs> you're not going to like this, but it's, and this is really hard because everything I'd learned, uh, everything I'd seen before, they're like, this just isn't efficient and you're losing so much time. And like this eight or 10 hours you're, that Allison is spending a week running your studio 
could you could boil this down to like 10 or 15 minutes if you're just willing to change the operational flow. And so that really lit me up. And then that set us on this journey where I went out and interviewed about, gosh, well over 200 people I directly talked to. And since then, at least 500 academic tutors, personal trainers, piano teachers, all these different people that work in this client-based businesses and tried to see what they had done and tried to look for these three lines for where we could reduce friction, where we hmm. could automate a cancellation policy, like anything that stressed us out that we didn't want to do, you know, sending appointment notifications, eliminating invoicing, you know, and just by eliminating invoicing in this app, it took like 75% of the real admin tasks and the stress. Because I'm sure if anybody that's listening to this that teaches, you know, you've sent an invoice before and then the client will send back a check with the wrong amount, or maybe they won't send the check at all. Or it'll come out of the clothes washer the next week. <laughs> so, you know, all, all these little things are just kind of like, oh, I hate talking to kids about money. Did your mom bring the check? Mm. Taking these away and, and writing them down and then ironing them out has been the process. And mm. I just got so fascinated in it because technology and start, I mean, I always like, I'm like, it's about as hard as learning how to play a Bach fugue. Yeah. Like I used to think I can do anything. I can play a Bach fugue on the guitar pretty well. That was pretty hard. This is the same kind of problem solving, which is just like mm -hmm. real meticulous, figuring out little challenges that, that occur in our world and, and trying to, to iron them out. My name is Eric Branner. I'm the CEO and founder of Fonz.com. I'm also a third generation music teacher. We started Fonz because I desperately needed software to run my music school more efficiently and professionally. Fonz design is sleek, modern, and minimalist, but its focus is on maximizing your revenue, building your business, and facilitating trust with your students. In a recent survey, the average studio owner said using Fonz saved them 10 hours each month in admin tasks, and 88% of the teachers said using Fonz significantly improved their job satisfaction. Perhaps the coolest part about Fonz is the community of providers we're building and how we're working together to elevate the amazing work we get to do as independent music teachers. Sign up today for your free trial at Fonz.com. Book a demo with our team and see all the ways Fonz can help you earn more while creating a greater impact on your community. Thanks. No, I love it. And so any flutist who's listening to this, if they're trying to find their niche, right? And they're trying to be the solopreneur, musicpreneur, trying to forge their own path. And you're a shining example of this. You are a guitarist, a guitar teacher, right? But then you found technology. So I guess my question is, if there's a flutist out there who's listening to this and they know that they want to be their own music boss, right? And there's a lot of flutists out there. They need to find something that gives them a very unique thumbprint or something that really defines them within the flutes community. Do you seek that out? Like, are you really intentional with that? Or do you let the cards fall as they may? I hope that makes sense. Are you saying about finding the opportunity? Or? Yeah, finding the opportunity and finding your place within the community. Because mm. there are like hundreds of thousands of flutists, just like guitarists, right? But you have... I mean, if you think of a pool of guitarists, you've kind of funneled yourself down to saying, I am now one of many because I'm a guitarist, a teacher, and I have this business management tool, right, that helps people. So same thing, like, did you seek that? I mean, obviously you sought it out, but any advice for the flutist out there who's trying to find their unique place within the community? Mm, you know, I... I definitely do just from what, from what I've seen is, you know, the, especially for an instrument like flute and how much people value that it's such a cool instrument to study is that I, during the pandemic, a lot of people were like, I'm taking my business worldwide, right? Mm -hmm. I'm just going to be, I'm going to teach flute all over the world. And it's going to be amazing. That is really difficult, right? Where every geographic range, wherever you are, I really encourage people to begin by impacting their community directly around them. Right. Because I think mm. every community can support in a beautiful way an artist. You know, I played a lot of funerals. I played a lot of weddings. I really kind of just dug myself into this. An important thing to keep in mind if you're trying to go on your own, if you work for yourself, is a term called MRR or ARR, monthly recurring revenue. Right. right. If you're trying to make your living doing this off gigs, it's tough. You might make have a great month and get a bunch of gigs and the next month you won't. But a fabulous student, they stick with you, right? And they stick with mm -hmm. you for years. So if you're if you're trying to get something going to work for yourself, 
there's another term called LTV, lifetime value. If we get a wonderful student, a great student can stay for years and can be worth five, ten thousand dollars yeah. right? Paying you every month. That is awesome, right? And, and it's easier to find someone within 25 miles of you that will, that will pay you well and do that than it is to just throw a blanket out over the world. So I would say hmm. you can always do that later and have your courses and go big depending on what you're doing, but it's great to impact community one. Two is to just really value yourself, hmm. right? Because we see it all the time. Doesn't matter what your instrument is. I hang out with a bagpiper every week, part of a mastermind. He's crushing it. You know, it's a niche and people are really interested in it. They want to do it. But I think it's really important to be courageous enough to value your work, to ask your community to support you and then give 100%. Because yeah. once you're being authentically awesome and you're making this great living and you're like, wow, I'm living the life I want to. And I owe it all to you for coming to see me every week. Mm. Then you get more gigs, mm. right? So you've got like, I, I see lessons as kind of like my oxygen mask, right? Where mm. I can always teach. I can always make a living. I'm not, if I get fired by one client, I still have like 39 more if I want, you know, you know what I'm saying? So there's, right. there's a real security to being a music teacher. That's awesome. Mm. And people, I think, take for granted, mm. right? As you build your studio, you impact your community, you live an authentic life, and then you can start branching out into doing these, whether it's a course or whether you're like looking for another niche you want to do or taking different gigs, but you can do them confidently, which is mm. really great. You're not desperate for them. That'd be my encouragement. Yeah, that's amazing. And I was kind of researching and getting ready for today's conversation. I could not find when Fonz was established would you mind mentioning that year? Sure. I mean, we started talking about Fonz, I think, in 2015. Okay. And, you know, and then it, it was a real process, you know, because mm -hmm. we were um, that whole research phase and, you know, it took a couple years. I was our first customer, so it took, you know, a couple of years to build it. It's not easy. Like whenever someone says, oh my gosh, I'm going to build an app, it is actually not just like a quick and easy thing. And there's a, there's a, like when you, if you have a big idea, the knowledge of like you hold it really close and hope nobody just like your intellectual property with your music. Mm. So it actually is a lot of work from <laughs> like the development and the engineering and building a team. So you know, we, we really see ourselves as having launched about around three years ago. And then it's been the entire time just iterating and improving and trying to further hone and polish. So we've been live for three and a half, four years. We've been around for five, five and a half years in concept. Mm -hmm. Wow. That's yeah. amazing. So a lot has happened in three and a yes. half years. Yeah. <laughs> so looking at Eric Branner, CEO of Fonz three and a half years ago and fast forwarding till now, how have you evolved as a businessman? Oh, well, I think I've become one. Really, okay. you know, and when I think about what I was doing before, which was being, you know, really just thinking at a different level. And now it's like I was working with myself and impacting community. And now I'm working, managing a team, which is much different. And I'm managing a large asset, which is the digital domain of Fonz.com and the app, Fonz.app. You know, I've learned a lot about reality, you know, that it's really hard and that doing big things is really challenging and we have to do it and we have to you know, stay persistent, just like we did with our music careers. Right. Mm. And I think what I would love to go back and I look forward to the day. I mean, I have no intention of ever quitting working because I love all the stuff that I've gotten to do. And I look forward to the day when I'm not a technology founder for a period of time. And I'm going back to doing music and mm. teaching music and performing music again with the mindset I've been able to get from this. And I just kind of, I'm really looking forward to seeing how that translates. Right. Because yeah. ultimately as an artist, it's so much different than being a business owner. You can be creative as a business owner, but it's the authenticity of a human is that what makes an artist. And is there a way to do that with a business acumen? Because a lot of people don't. There's a lot of great business people that that lose that sense of what makes their art magic, right? Interesting. And so, yeah, it is. And I think it'll be fun to explore. Having that integrity. Mm -hmm. as yeah, a business. sure. Yeah. But no, I, I totally agree. And I feel like, you know, I was a business owner. I didn't realize I was a business owner back from 2009 to 2015, teaching 50, 60 students in the district. And then I went to get my doctorate, came back, and then I decided, okay, um, academia is not working out for me. I'm going to go ahead and go back to being a solopreneur. But it's elevated so much more than 
those six years. Like I'm going through the C-suite, wearing all these different hats of CEO, CTO, things like that. And so I just feel like everything for me and my knowledge is just skyrocketing. And it's going from like A to X, like boom. (laughs) And the reason why I say all of that is because you're right. There are seasons. I mean, I feel like I have this like CEO cap on a little bit longer nowadays, more so than being a flutist. And I can't wait to get things implemented, things set up where I can go back and being an artist more full time. But I'm starting to see the parallels. I'm starting to see how like me being a podcaster has made me be more authentic through my flute. And I'm so blessed to have that experience because I've had, you know, really horrible stage fright and owning my own voice and knowing that I can bring something to the table. Well, podcasting has taught that through my spoken voice. So when I go to my musical voice, it's really organic and natural. And same thing with like working with people through the business and collaborating and networking and really listening to your clients, right? And then coming back into an ensemble and really listening to the people on the stage. I don't know. I just love how things connect like that. Oh, I love everything you're saying, which is, it's so true, which is that you do, you do your thing and it informs your other things, right? It makes you a more communicative, expressive human and you, and a more confident human. And that really helps when you pick up your instrument, right? You let go of those things that like, when speaking of being in your twenties, when just the thought, when you're, we're doing competitions or whatever, and we're just terrified of missing a note. It's like, I am so like, I miss so many notes in my life every single day, metaphorically now that I'm just like, wow, I can't believe that that's what I used to worry about is like yeah. buzzing a note, you know, in a hard passage. Wow. <laughs> and so, it, and then you don't miss the notes as much. Right. And it's like, you're playing way fewer scales, but you're playing better when I, I'm trying to tie those two worlds of, of our lives and our music in this context, but it's mm-hmm. really true. And uh, I love what else you said too, about how fast we're learning is by taking on something that's monumental like this and really big and going for it, you know, fail or succeed, you learn so much, right? Mm-hmm. And you learn so much about things and people and how things work and building things. And that's just so good for us as humans to bite into something and to go for it and take a risk and be scared and try different projects. It's awesome. I love I love how you frame that. Oh, thank you. Yeah. And isn't there a quote by Eleanor Roosevelt who says something like that, like try something not terrifying, but try something new every day that terrifies you, something mm-hmm. along those lines. I think so. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. shoot. And you're right, you know, like mistakes, you know, mistakes through the flute would just terrify me, you know, when I was younger. But when I podcast and when I talk with brilliant people day in and day out, such as yourself, I mean, I'm podcasting probably three to five days a week. I mean, I had a call this morning with a wonderful gentleman out in Chicago. Tonight, I have another podcast interview. It's just around the clock. And I say all of that because I have to remind myself, you're going to, um, you're going to, (laughs) ah, you might have to say, let me back up and try that again. It's going to happen, you know, but you keep going, you keep finding that flow and finding that synergy and, you know, picking up on the conversation. Things are going to happen on the stage. You're going to miss a note. There's going to be a door slam. Something's going to distract you. And how are you going to navigate that and keep, you know, pushing forward? And so anyways, just to wrap up that thought, there's so many parallels here. There really are. It's great. Yeah. Cool. So speaking of all of these different hats, circling back to the beginning of this conversation and being CEO, guitar, guitar teacher, things like that. How do you juggle it all? Like, how do you manage your time in a way where it's healthy, where you establish healthy boundaries so you can protect what's sacred to you, like family time? I know you're a father. How do you approach that? That's really challenging. You know, and I think that I, you know, because Fonz has definitely, I, as a musician, I was the same way. We have a very, as when we're really focused on previously, like really mastering an instrument or you know, that mindset that we get where we just can't stop. You can't stop thinking about what you're working on. I have a very difficult time staying mindful and turning that off. Right. And it's been like that since the day we started, because I've been so interested in it. And Mm -hmm. so, you know, people ask me how I'm doing, especially with friends. And it's hard to explain when you're doing something that's this intense, like starting a startup. 
uh, dealing with investors, raising money, uh, building something like this. It's, and it's just the same as it would be for if you were getting ready to go on a recital tour or getting a really great symphony gig. It's, it's a lot. Family is super important. Health is really hard to keep up. You've got to do it. Sleep is something you have to focus on. But my mind, I mean, the, the honest truth is my mind like rockets awake every night in the middle of the night. 100% of nights I'll wake up and I'm a pretty chill person, Yeah. right? I'm a really comfortable in my skin person. It is very hard dealing with the stress of running all these things. And I say this because I'm also very happy. Like, and I, and I, when I tell people, I'm telling them what's going on. I've got a lot of anxiety. I'm managing a lot of stuff. I'm dropping some balls here and there. I'm doing family always comes first. I um, mean, just like anything, but I'm in a place of being really content because it feels like the right thing for this part of my life. Mm -hmm. And I'm really excited to be a part of something big. I've come to terms with the idea of what failure is and what it can be. And that it's not something that defines you. Right. Mm -hmm. And as we go. That was another great thing about being a uh, classical musician you know, and doing, you know, guitar competitions and stuff like that is, you know, you learn how to fail and you learn that that's part of the process and you can start to see a bigger picture. So to answer your question, I don't think I balance it well. Okay. Uh, I do focus a lot on mindfulness. I meditate a lot. I really focus on food. I totally quit drinking. I was mm -hmm. a social drinker forever mm -hmm. and I just didn't have time for it. So I've had to really do a lot of editing out of mm -hmm. just necessity. Right. Where it's like, I don't have time to have my mind be cloudy. You know, mm. it's just like with you, with meeting all these people, I need to be thoughtful. I need to listen to the people that work for our company. I need to listen to our customers. I need to express myself honestly and, you know, be honest with the people that I'm dealing with. And I need to set a good example to my kids too. Right. Cause we're doing yeah. this kind of bold and different things. So it's a great question. And I, I feel like most people, we all really struggle with that, <laughs> with overwhelm and, trying to stay afloat right now. And I think everybody's doing kind of the best they can. The pandemic did not help anybody, by the way. <laughs> no, it did not. <laughs> but I appreciate your honesty. And I appreciate you being so open and vulnerable and just stating the truth and saying, actually, sometimes I nail it right on the head. And other days, I really struggle with this. And this is a thing. And, you know, getting ready for today's conversation, and I've been noticing you from not afar, but afar through like social media as um, our relationship scaled. I didn't know if I was going to be crossing a line asking a question like what you post on Twitter, because you mentioned on Twitter, like I'm walking around, it's 3 a.m. And my heart went out to you because I really struggle with insomnia, too. And it's, oh, man, when you can't sleep and then you have a full day in front of you, like, Geez, Louise, you know, mm. and it's the mind. It's all of these thoughts. Like, what if I did this? Or what if I did that? How could I say this? I mean, or how can I design this class just so and articulate these ideas? I mean, it's a thing. It really is. So thank you for being so honest, because when you see people like from my point of view, when I see the Eric Branners of the world and everything you're juggling, I'm like, oh, my gosh, he's got it to Together. And then when you read a Twitter message saying, I'm circling the house, I'm like, oh, he's a normal dude. Like, <laughs> this is yeah. a stress for him as well. No one has it together. Yes. No. It's, <laughs> we're, we're all <laughs> hanging in there together, doing the best we can. Yeah. So, heads up a friendly tip from me to you and for everybody if you deal with insomnia, this does help reduce the amount of nights that I cannot sleep. And it's called primal sleep from a company called Primal Harvest. And it's totally natural, organic. Uh, you take two capsules and it's melatonin, lavender, hops, and it really helps you sleep naturally. And if you wake up at two, three in the morning with your mind going, you have a better chance of slipping back into sleep. Cool. And it's so good that I don't do the month to month, like one bottle will serve you for one month at a time, but I go ahead and buy the bulk of three. So that way I'm good for three months. And that way at the end of the month, if I forgot to reorder, I'm not out. Um, and then you wake up and you're not groggy. You know how sometimes those like night sleeping pills, like when you have a cold and you take NyQuil, the next day you wake up, sure. you're like, you've got this like weird, like sleep hangover thing. This does not do that. Fantastic. So, yeah. <laughs> <Cool>. <laughs> That's my pick for today. <laughs> done. Yeah, done. Oh, shoot. I know we covered a lot, Eric, um, between studio building and your business, time management. Is there anything that you want to leave the listener with so I don't like pull the rug from underneath you and you're like, whoa, you just totally 
jolted me out of that conversation. No, I don't think so. Okay. Uh, it's, it's, it's been a fabulous chat and I really I appreciate everything you've asked. They're great mm -hmm. questions and it's really awesome to share it. You know, I just, the thing that I just always encourage and I always come back to is I see this all the time is if you are a musician, making an awesome living is a choice, right? It is also a job. And so if you look at it as your job and you value yourself, you can create an amazing life. Right. And we we see it every day. We see people that are doing this, people that are making these choices. They're deciding to, to do it. And it's so exciting, you know, because that's that's the goal is, you know, we're looking at a window. We have a lot of data. People like us uh, that are doing this are going to have a very good next decade. Right. Mm. Because people are seeking cultural experiences. People are seeking to improve themselves and their children. People want to have authentic interactions with other human beings hmm. you know, he does all these things and so it is a people are seeing it as a necessity into raising their kids and to bettering themselves and so this thing it's not going to get all it's not going to go away because of online courses or because of youtube those things just are going to empower us to get our message out further to build bigger audiences uh you know from everything we can see there's not nearly enough flute teachers there aren't mm -hmm. enough guitar teachers. There are so many people that need this. And then to be creative, right? Wherever you are with whatever you want to do, there's so many ways to swing it. And there's so many ways to, to find your thing that might work. For me, it's like I love teaching private lessons. I really believe in one-on-one -on -one communication. I really love mentoring kids and people on their journey and really focusing on what they're doing and trying to improve their paths and help their paths in life. Some people love the group things. Some people, you know, there's just, there's some people really want to focus on courses and reach a whole lot of people. There's all these ways and they're all okay. And hmm. they're all, and, but picking one. And my last final idea is focus is that okay. the other thing that I see is the difference between the people that are really successful and is a, they believe in themselves, but B, they focus on one area, right? Is they say, if I say I'm Eric and I need to make mid six figures as a, guitar teacher to, to, to do what I want to do. I'm just throwing out random numbers. I focus on that. I'm not focusing on until I've achieved that because it's mm. just like we were talking about earlier. You can't be a great parent, partner, business owner, guitar player, teacher, health guru fitness for yourself. Something's going to fall to the wayside. You can only pick, I think it was Sandborg that uh, the Facebook book about that was talking about, you can only do like three things right? You yeah. And so this is the same thing with your career is pick an area, put on your, if it's teaching, put on your life mask and make that work. And once you make that work, then branch out. Uh, but I think focus would be the encouragement we see the most. That's the most helpful to say, just do this one thing. If you just want to do gigs, just focus on gigs, right? Okay. If you want, you know, and because you won't be as effective spread out, right? You find, and then once something's working and something running, then you can hand it off to hire somebody else. Right, you could hire someone to help you with your social, or uh, you can farm out these different things. But I think I think that operationally and encouragement wise are the things that we're really excited to share and to see is that there's so many people that are doing well, hmm. right? So it's a great time to be us. Oh my goodness, those last two minutes could have just been the episode itself. <laughs> Not that everything else was beforehand wasn't great, but that right there, if you. I'm going to have to do like a little sneak peek because this is at the end of the episode. I want to make sure everybody hears what you just said, because I needed to hear that. That was so inspirational and helpful. And I just love mm. being a podcast host and interviewer where I get to like peek in, inside people's minds and really pick the brains and see what's in your world. And everything you just said, just it really covers I think Eric Branner's world, you know, just the way you go about your world, how you navigate it. And that was, that was magic for me. So thank you. Oh, thank you. That's so kind of you. Yeah. So as we're wrapping up today's conversation, do you have a pick for the listener? Oh, a pick. <laughs> it could be anything under the sun. It doesn't even have to be music related. It could be your favorite book, podcast, whatever. Oh, you know, I, I read a lot and I have a, a book. I, I read a lot of business books 
and I really, um, that, and that, cause that's kind of, I've been teaching myself a lot about that. And I, and I found this book lately that really kind of changed my perspective that I think would help anybody. I'm going to share it with you. Hold it. It's on my shelf. One cool. Second. This really goes with what we're talking about. Mm-hmm. This book is, it's called selling with noble purpose. Okay. And it's a book about sales which are scary. And we don't really learn a whole lot about those until we, we should, but we really don't. But it's it's called Selling with Noble Purpose by Lisa Earl McLeod. And it's basically this idea of our mindset. And as we go about our life as, say, a flutist or a music teacher or whatever it is we're doing or a tech designer is the purpose being what drives you. Mm. So as I'm talking to someone and teaching them about fonts or guitar I'm really, my heart is driven by what that music lesson is going to do for them over the long term. When I talked about bonds, I'm visualizing that person making more money and being less stressed out and being a more effective person in their community. Mm-hmm. And the idea behind this selling with noble purpose is that because sales are gross, right? Like I, traditionally, that's pretty, it's like they come across as gross, but they shouldn't be. Mm-hmm. Right. If, if you truly believe in what you're doing as you're promoting your podcast or your work or whatever, whatever it is that you're doing is that, you know, as you're teaching people to podcast or to get their messages out there, that that's amplifying who they are as a person. And so it's leaning into that, that emotion of that you have purpose and, and parlaying that into sales. And if you don't have something you believe in that will create those ripples in the universe and be, then do something else. Just don't sell it. Right? Okay. And so, and so I think it's, it's a really cool huh. book that, that helped me remember what's important and what we're working on. And, and then you can be confident as you talk to people about it, just like I'm really confident saying, oh my gosh, I should teach your kid guitar. I'm, I'm going to be able to help with what's going on. Like I'm stoked about this and I'm sure you, you, you feel the same way about the work you do. So mm. that's my pick. That's amazing. <laughs> I'm going to download it through Kindle ASAP. <laughs> Awesome. Awesome. <laughs> and it's funny when you're talking about like podcasting and me teaching other people how to podcast, you said to amplify your voice. I kid you not, Eric, that's my tagline to my class is to amplify. Really? Yeah, really. That's my tagline. <laughs> yeah. And that does so good. That's so much good. And so as you're doing that, you're giving people this voice, you're giving, you're amplifying it. And that's, that's something you can feel great about. And like, I don't know if you've ever had a job that's not awesome right? That you don't feel great about that many people do. Mm. It's, it, it's not, it's not a wonderful feeling, right? Where the work yeah. we get to do is we can live with ourselves, which is, and feel good about ourselves, which is so cool. Yeah. I couldn't agree more. That's amazing. Well, thank you for your time, talents, and expertise. And I just loved talking about these business topics. I loved shining a light onto your wonderful company fonts. And thank you so much for being a huge monumental force in our community. And thank you so much for having a warm heart and bringing people in and supporting everybody inside your orbit. Wow, thank you so much for having me. This has been really fun. I hope today's content has served you well. So friendly reminder, yet again, take out a pencil in your calendar and jot down Wednesday, December 15th, 2021 at 6 p.m. Central Time for the corporate sponsorship webinar that I'm going to host. This event is for you. I want to help you. I want you to start noticing how to not leave money on the table. I want you to start grabbing the CEOs of these different corporations and pulling them into your orbit. Find the win-win for everybody involved and let's start building a healthy stream of income for you and your business through corporate sponsorships. Go to my website at HeidiKBegay.com, sign up to the mailing list and you can receive your Zoom link to the event. Thank you so much. Let's talk about flute.